Good evening, my brothers and sisters, and welcome to another episode of A Word with Pastor Webb. I'm your host, Pastor Webb, and we have a very special guest this evening. We have the entrepreneur, the visionary leader, Mr. Gary Harfield. Please help me to salute and celebrate my friend and brother. <laughs> man, how's it going? How's it going? Uh, great, 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 Pastor Webb. It's uh, great to be here with you, and I look forward to the opportunity to share with you today. Okay, well, how, how was your drive? You drive? Did you drive fast? Yeah. You, how was it? Kind of slow. Kinda slow. I, okay. uh, I'm actually dealing with the uh, appendicitis. Oh, okay. So oh. I've been, you know, very deliberate and intentional at my young age of <laughs> trying to get in and out of the car and just take it easy. All right, appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. But we're not we're gonna prolong, not prolong the time, Doc. What's your story? Tell me how you grew up. Wow. So I grew up in small small town, rural America, uh, here in Florida, the Phoenix Springs, Florida, and uh, at that time. Uh, what was unique about small town America is that all we did was concentrate on sports, uh, football, baseball, basketball, whatever your sport or choice was. Right. And as, as you got a little bit older, maybe you chase girls. Okay. Okay. So that was the extent. We didn't have to worry about drugs and mollies and Percocets and all the different influences that our kids have today. Uh, my influence was, you know, how do we play, how do we get ready for summer, summer camp, two and three a days, okay. uh, how do we compete, how do we be a good student, uh, and what was next, like going to college and uh, being successful as our parents kind of poured into us and, and allowed us to stand on their shoulders and go to the next level. So for me, uh, my experience, I'm, I'm a small town country boy and uh, made my way uh, from Florida a &M University in engineering. F FAMU. FAMU. And, FAMU. Huh? Yeah. I'm a wild kid. I just didn't want to put it down. Okay. <laughs> well, I won't hold that against you. I, won't, I, I, I love you like a brother. Um, so I won't hold that against you. And the fact that uh, you made the wrong choice as far as uh, National Panhandlenic Organization. Okay, okay, okay. But uh, you know I love you like a brother. Yes, sir. But uh, yeah, that's my experience. That's right. that's where I came from, small town boy, country boy. Uh, just uh, listened and was humble and uh, had good parents that poured into me. Right, and, and this this place is this town is located where? Uh, the Panhandle. So oh, okay. Fort Walton Beach, Destin, San Destin area. Okay. It is okay. the fastest growing county in the state of Florida, and the fifth and the fastest growing in the nation. All right, all right, it's exploding up all there. Right, all right. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Now give me three words that best describe you and why. I would say the three words that best describe me are humble. Uh, and humble, I would say, uh, it was a natural instinct. Um, as I looked at like sports, academics, uh, I was always looking for ways to help people. Mm -hmm. So if it was uh, running routes, or when we broke the huddle and one of the linemen or one of the running backs okay. need to know which hole to go through, you know, I was looking for ways to help people. I never was condescending. Uh, and I think I picked that up, honestly, uh, as an innate characteristic, maybe okay. from my mother or from my father. But I didn't define or chart out to be humble. It was just something that God gave me okay. that I appreciate. And it's actually worked extremely well for me, whether in per my personal life or sports or academics or my professional life. Humility goes a long way. Yes, sir. Uh, I think the other characteristic would be I'm very focused. Okay, okay. Uh, as I've looked out and tried to achieve uh, different things in my professional life, right. uh, I was very focused on those and very strategic. So I would make the necessary steps uh, to do those things. So as I transitioned out of working in corporate America, right. as I built the businesses, as I look for opportunities to expand and grow and generate financial freedom for my family and for myself, very focused on that. Okay. So my steps were very deliberate. As I looked at opportunities, I would do the research, make sure we had the financial wherewithal to make those steps. Okay and then just do what I think entrepreneurs do. So what generally happens with individuals is that they'll talk about an opportunity and they'll research it and they'll not make the next step, which okay. is the actual jump or the leap of faith. So for me and for most entrepreneurs, 
you do, hopefully you do, the due diligence, you do the research. Right. Um, and then, for me, I've always believed that if, if God's not going to teach me how to fly, he'll have something solid for me to stand on. Amen. And I'd Amen. make that step, and uh, it wasn't always easy, right, right. you know, but um, the end result was through persistent, persistence, okay. through prayer, okay. through uh, favor, okay. uh, we were able to be successful. All right, so yeah. humble, focus, Yeah, humble. I think the final one would be uh, humble, focus. The final one would be... Um, that's a good question. The final one would be, Reggie, um, leader. Leader, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, there's always this conversation about are leaders born or can right. you develop a leader? Right. I, in, in my humble opinion, I believe leaders are born. Okay. Um, and you develop characteristics, you develop uh, leadership skills as you grow. But um, I think you, in your experience as a pastor um, and as an educator in, in higher ed, probably have seen individuals that come in with just a tremendous amount of raw skill and talent. Right. And you think to yourself, okay, once they are defined and redefined, they'll be a strong leader. Right, right. Um, and I think that's true generally speaking where uh whether it's in sports academics if right. it's in uh profession whatever it may be i think you were born with it amen and through grace and mercy you're able to define and redefine and maybe have a mentor right. uh to help you groom and mm -hmm. get prepared for the next level so i i think for me humility strategic or being focused in leadership. leadership. All right. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect job. Yeah. Uh, why did you choose your current profession? Wow. So my current profession chose me. Okay. Okay. So I'll give you the, the short version. My uh, sister and I started about 22 years ago. My youngest sister, LaCanya, Tammy Hartfield. And we started out in this entrepreneurial endeavor. And I did the research, wrote the business plan, and we were getting ready to build a half a million dollar facility in our hometown. Um, we didn't have all of the capital needed to inject it to the project. Right. We needed about 100,000, um, and I had about 50. Uh, Tammy, at that time, was working as a waitress at the Columbia Restaurant okay. at the St. Petersburg Pier. Okay. So she didn't have the capital right. uh, either. So we worked together over a period of years, and we found a smaller facility in Pinellas County okay. in Seminole, Florida. And we bought the facility for 170000 $30,000 for the business. That was December 20th, 2002. Okay. About 12 hours later, she passed away. Oh, my gosh. She was in her early 30s. I was 29, 30 years old. Wow. And here I am with this business. Everything that I had uh, in terms of resources and assets have been poured into the business. Now, mind you, it's December 21st, 2002. My sister's just passed away who's gonna run the business. And I'm in corporate America between Chicago and New York. And here I am, have to make a I have to make a decision. It's right around Christmas time. Uh, my youngest sister uh, has just passed away unexpectedly. And uh, we're in a position now where we have to figure out, do we rescind the offer or do we move forward? Right. So we started out with eight residents in that assisted living facility and about one and a half employees. As of 2019, before I sold a large portion of the business, we had more than 200 clients that we served every day, uh, more than 100 staff between Pinellas and Hillsborough County. So I say all that to say that it was not a conscious choice. Um, everything that I did um, was, I believe, divinely destined. Right. And I walked into this favor, I walked into this opportunity uh, that I believe my sister um, and God's grace and mercy had prepared for us. Wow. Uh, so that's honestly how I arrived at what I do today. Amen. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I, well, I did my research on you. Uh, okay. What is Serenity Village Incorporated? Mm. 
So Serenity Village Incorporated, it started out back in early 2000, 2002. It started out as a healthcare facility. Okay. Uh, assisted living, caring for the elderly. Yeah. And in addition, we were also caring as we grew, uh, caring for the developmentally and intellectually disabled. Right. So we did that through group homes. Okay. So we did that solidly for 12 years. Okay. And as we looked at the landscape, and again, this is part of leadership um, and focus and strategy, uh, we were looking to diversify. How do we, number one, maintain what we have? Uh, we reached a point where we could walk away from working for anyone else and uh, only work for ourselves and concentrate 100% on growing the business. So in 2012, we understood that there was a mandate for insurance for the providers that provide similar services to what we do in right. healthcare. Assisted living, group homes, anything home, uh, home health, right. anything healthcare related. Right. We understood that space. So I took the t test to be a licensed insurance property and casualty agent. Okay. And uh, as the mandate rolled out across the state of Florida, I was licensed. <laughs> I opened up shop. Okay. Hired a couple of individuals. Okay. And we started a scratch agency uh, from literally nothing. Uh, in over eight years, we hired five or six individuals, generated more than $5.3 million in assets and premium. And uh, we're licensed in Florida and Georgia. So uh, Serenity Village started as a healthcare facility, we developed a strong foundation, understood our competencies, our skill sets, developed relationships. Mm -hmm. In 2012, it expanded into insurance. And now, um, over the course of the years, as God has given us opportunities, we've invested in property, okay. commercial property and residential property. So primarily commercial, but we looked at opportunities to again diversify and expand our portfolio. So what's Serenity Village? It is healthcare, it is property and casualty, it is a true real estate investment entity. Okay. So uh, that's how we've developed over the last 22 years. All right. Yeah. All right, that's awesome, okay. Thank now, you. what are some of the pressures that comes along with owning your own business? Mm. I would say the first pressure uh, that I experience and that most people will experience is being undercapitalized. Okay. I have seen and over then, the, then when you say undercapitalized, not have enough money. Not have enough money. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So what I have I have seen and experienced over the years is that black men and women have had tremendous ideas. Uh, if you could think back to the lawn care businesses. Yeah. Yeah. Janitorial yeah. businesses. Right. We didn't have the resource. We had the idea. Right. We didn't have the resources, the financial resources, right. to scale that right. and create a legacy business for our families, for our kids, and so forth. Or whatever, if it was making widgets, whatever that was, uh, for years, black men and women have had tremendous ideas. And what has been one of the biggest issues is uh, their ability to finance it and scale it. Okay. Uh, and knowing how to develop relationships with a lending institution, build your credit, uh, develop a line of credit, okay. uh, and have working capital. Uh, know that you can't spend everything that you make. Um, so in God's word, he speaks to that my people perish because of a right. lack of knowledge. knowledge. Right. Right. So in that, an essential part of that is the knowledge. Right. So the knowledge in terms of developing relationships with banking institutions, making sure you have strong credit, and then being able to differentiate once you get to the point where you can, where your business is an entity that finances and is able to generate revenue on, an, on its own without your personal mm -hmm. uh, credit being affected. So right. I think uh, that's an essential part of understanding what the biggest issues are in terms of being an entrepreneur. Uh, the other part of that I share real quickly is that I read in Forbes that there's three types of capital. There's human capital, there's financial capital, 
and their social capital. Right. So in Forbes, they went on to say that social capital is the most important form of capital. Because if you have social capital, meaning that relationship with the banking institution, with the CEO of the institution, Bingo. with individuals that understand what you do, that have a relationship with you, they're willing to make an investment into you and your business uh, based on credibility and relationship, your social capital. And if you're able to do that and you're in those circles, uh, in those board meetings, in those uh, community meetings where you're able to position yourself uh, where the deals happen. Right. Maybe you're playing <clears throat> golf, maybe you're playing pickleball, mm -hmm. whatever, or you're attending church together. Whatever that may be, you're building social capital. Right. And so your ability, number one, to generate now financial capital becomes a lot easier. If you have the financial capital, then you can make the investment in the human right. capital. Right. So I would say those two things are definitely understanding and having knowledge, and then three being, two, being able to apply it in developing social capital. Perfect. Yeah. Now you do know this is a social capital interview, right? Absolutely, <laughs> definitely. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, next question. Uh, I heard that you are an author and you wrote a book. Yes. Um, number one, what's the name of the book and okay. why did you write it? Oh, wow, so I wrote the book uh, and the name of the, or the title of the book is Stan. Stan, okay, okay. Um, and I wrote it because it was a pivot point in my life. By, what do I mean by pivot point? So it was one of those moments in life where you understand that God is getting ready to take you to the next level. Right. So in doing so, everything good and bad that I needed to express uh, I tried to express in that book. Now, the pillars of the book was educate, motivate, and empower. Right. So some of the bad stuff uh, you can't write about, uh, you can't fully express in a way that maybe it takes away from education, motivation, right. and empowerment. But you have to tell the story and tell it in a way so compelling that number one is true, it's sincere, but it maintains those pillars of educate, motivate, and empower. Right. So the book, uh, the title, Stan, is uh, drawn from a relationship uh, that I have with my mother. She okay. passed away last year, okay. June of 2020. Okay. I was in undergrad and struggling through matriculating, understanding how mm -hmm. to make it through this next level of life right. as a young man. And I'll never forget, I was standing on the side of the road in Tallahassee, Florida, and I couldn't get the financial resources that I needed to register for classes. My, right. Neither one of my parents had gone to college, so they didn't understand what it meant right. to be there and buying books and whatever the other right. resources that you need to be successful. Right. And I was an engineer major, and that was not my choice. That was my parents living vicariously through me. So here I am, an engineer major, I needed not only your regular books like English and, and, and maybe calculus, but I needed a T-square, I needed an engineering calculator, I needed those type of uh, resources right. uh, that cost us an extra amount of money to be able to secure and be successful in your classes. So I'm standing on the side of the road and I'm talking to my mom and I date myself a little bit. I was on the pay phone. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm listening and explaining to my mom what's going on. I'm, I want to go back, Reggie. I want to go back to my hometown. I want to go back to the place where I was comfortable. I want to go back to the place where I was the big fish in the small pond. I yes. was Gary Hartfield. Yes. I was, you know, part of our state championship football team. I was, you know, the man. A popular guy. I was the man. Yes. So I wanted to go back to that. And at Florida a and University, everybody was the man. You know, <laughs> and then you have Florida State right across the street. Right. So you got 30, 40,000 young, brilliant minds there. And now I'm having to compete with that and compete with the fact that I don't have uh, the resources to be successful. So I'm standing there, I'm crying, uh, ready, trying to figure it out. And f so I'm explaining to my mother all the challenges and I'm hoping she'll say, well, just pack up your things and come home. Mm. And in this conversation, this is a matter of seconds, uh, I'm explaining to her 
that I have holes, I don't have financial aid, I don't have the resources. And she said, I, you know what I want you to do? And I'm listening because I'm thinking I've done everything possibly I can do. Right. Uh, she said, after you've done everything you can possibly do, Gary, I want you to stay in. My Jesus. And I'm listening. So this was a pivot point. I, at that moment, changed from a boy to a man. My, my. And she said, after you've done everything that you can do. And I'm thinking, OK, now I can say I've done everything I can do and I can come home pack up my little car and go home. Right. She said, I want you to stand anyhow. What do you do with that? Amen. I'm 18 years old. My Jesus. And she spoke into my life um, what I needed right. to endure. So, and mm -hmm. when I say endure, it wasn't only about that moment or my undergraduate experience. It was about my life as a man, a man of Christ, and what that would mean from that point on and what I was speaking to my mentee's life, my children's life, my children's children's life and whoever I came in contact with. Now God had given her. Uh, she he, God has spoken through her this uh, thing that was essential for me to be able to endure. So his purpose for me, uh, God understood that it would be challenged along through that experience and along through life and that I needed something that I could always refer back to to help me to endure as a man. Amen. So she said, after you've done everything you can possibly do, stand anyhow. There was no instructions with that, but stand, <laughs> but stand anyhow. So that being said, I'm standing there. All of my excuses were invalid at that point. Mm. And I pivoted. I, at that time, I left the protection and the what you will uh, define as kind of the shield that your parents have over you. Right. And now I'm a man in this world developing, growing, maturing on my own as a Christian. Amen. So for me, as I reflected over the first 45 years when I started to pen my memoir, Stan, uh, that was the most pivotal point because at that time it allowed me to now fast forward 45 years as a successful entrepreneur, Amen. as a father, as a, as an educator, as a leader, uh, everything pivoted on that point. So that's where the title of the book Amen. comes from, Stan. Perfect. Perfect. Um, you're busy, man. What are some of your hobbies? What, what do you do for fun? Wow. So golf. Golf. Okay. Okay. I love to play golf, fishing, okay. um, and conversations like, like these. Um, okay. A number of times when you and I connect, it could be years. Okay. And we just reconnect like it was just yesterday. Yeah, I know, I know. So I would say the brotherhood and fellowship is important for okay. me. And it, it could be years. Okay. But having good men uh, that pour into you, and then likewise, you may be able to add something to them. Uh, that's important for me. Okay. All yeah. right. Okay. And, uh, what do you see as the biggest struggle with young people today? One of the things that I talked about in um, a blog post and uh, that I refer to in my book is called the law of difference. Talk about it. Talk about it. Law so difference. the law of difference speaks to uh, being created as God's masterpiece. And of the 7 billion, 8 billion people on the face of the planet, he made us each unique. So why would you try and be a counterfeit version of someone else? Now, it's a natural tendency for young people to try and do that, to try and emulate and be something that they're not. But I believe for them to realize their purpose, for them to be the greatest Okay. Um, and I call it magnum opus. It's mm -hmm. called it's Latin for great work or your pinnacle work for you to realize that you realize that by realizing your difference and appreciating that and knowing that God intended it to be that way. So if you become a counterfeit version 
of someone else. You've just discounted yourself greatly. So who are we to question uh, the maker of all things, the maker, creator of heaven and earth um, in terms of how do we present ourselves to the world? So I, I think that's what's most important for young people today and even more seasoned people today is realizing your difference, realizing that you are a master's piece and that once you are able to fully receive and appreciate that, that's when you're able to walk into your full purpose and walk into where it is that God uh, has purpose for you to be. Yeah. Well, you're deep, well, you're deep or whatever. Well, yeah, you went deep you. on it. <laughs> I love it, I love it. Thank now, you. If you had one wish, what would that be? If I had one wish, one what wish. would it be? So as I referenced and read uh, through scripture, and um, you'll notice I always refer back to scripture. Yes, sir. That's the one thing that has been consistently true. Amen. And he said, God said that heaven and earth would pass away before. The word of God. Uh, and the, the dot of an eye or yeah. the cross of a T would fail. So the one thing I would wish for, bro, it would be uh, wisdom. Wisdom, okay. okay. Yeah. That's the one thing that I would wish for. Okay, uh, okay. Now, what is the one thing that some may know about you uh, and others may not know? Okay. I, I would say the one thing that, that some may know about me that others don't know is that I am a, I'm an empowerment type leader. Okay, okay. Meaning that I empower individuals to be the best uh, that they can be in, in their role. However, when you're not responding, I'm not a nice guy. <laughs> so it, I'm not a mean guy. I'm saying I'm not a nice guy. Right, right. So in leadership, that sometimes means that I have to figure out what resources I need to pour into you to help you get to the point where uh, we need you to be uh, as we operate in a business or whatever type of environment that we're in. And sometimes that may mean that this is not your season, at least in our organization. Amen. And that may mean that I need to help you go <laughs> so you can grow. So, <laughs> so that's uh, probably one thing that uh, people do not know about me is that when, especially in business, uh, I believe that as a leader of that organization that God places us as stewards. Amen. So you have to protect uh, that thing that he's giving you. And being a good steward sometimes meaning, uh, means that you have to define structure and enforce discipline. Uh, which, which is hard sometimes. Yeah, 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 it, yeah I yeah. think that's probably one of the most difficult lessons that uh, individuals have to learn. And sometimes they never learn it in terms of how to you know, develop structure and enforce discipline. Right, so uh, let me pick it back on that. So what do you tell a leader who, who's leading, mm. who's focused, and you have folks on the sideline, you just, just mm. you should be doing this, you know, dogs barking. How you deal with those dogs who's barking on the side? <laughs> I, think, I think that's a natural part of life. Right. Uh, and the idea is for good leaders is that you try to, to the extent possible, take in all the information. Right and review it, pray on it, make an assessment uh, based on the wisdom, those filters that God has given you. And in doing so, you learn which ones uh, you need to act on immediately, which ones need to be put in the parking lot for another time. And then there's others that with the breath of kindness, you just have to blow away. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I think that's the most important part is that, you know, as, as you mature in your relationship with God and as a leader, and there's a process of maturation. It just doesn't happen overnight. You're seasoning your maturation. There's a process, but you have to be able to, even with the noise, uh, be able to pull out of that um, and filter it through those filters that God has given you. What's applicable now, what may be applicable in the future, and then, um, with a breath of kindness, what do you need to just blow away? Okay. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Now, what are some of the early mistakes you made in life you had to overcome? I think I wouldn't necessarily say a, a mistake because the connotation is wrong. But I was a teenage dad. 
Okay. I was a father at 16 years old. Mm. And um, looking back at that experience, the difference uh, for me and the young lady who uh, I share a parenting relationship with uh, was that we had strong mothers that stood in the gap. They knew that we were young. They knew we had our whole lives in front of us. So they stood in the gap. Mm -hmm. by, and for those who are not aware by what I mean uh, by standing in the gap is that they took on the responsibility of mother and father as caregiver for our daughter until we were able to realize our roles as parents. We were 16 years old. We had no idea. We were kids ourselves. Right. So I think for me, as I look back on that experience, that was one of those times where, you know, if, if I had a different set of choices, I wouldn't have made that same choice. Mm. Um, but in the end, the, my daughter, she graduated from Florida a and University as well. Uh, she's doing extremely well. She's working on a master's degree and uh, she's flourishing. So I, 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 mm. I think the connotation of mistake is wrong. I think it's just one of those times in life where, you know, your choices, and your decision set uh, was limited. And you made a choice that now affected your life and, and others' individual lives, you know, for, for eternity. Mm. Yeah. It's a good kid, but made a bad choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Um, how do you balance family, work, fun? <laughs> so uh, when I started the business, balancing uh, family, work, fun, was non-existent. I'll, okay. I'll be 100% open and transparent. I, I was driven. Uh, my being driven in terms of growing the business, expanding right. the business, was based on a need, an innate need, to provide for my family. Great family, right. Yeah. So I wanted to be able to do that without uh, going into work one day and being laid off or being discriminated against because of the color of my skin or my gender or whatever it may be, I wanted to be able to provide for my family consistently with a level of financial freedom that would allow me to elevate my family and elevate myself. <clears throat> so I think as, you know, as I really look at it, uh, that for me was, was the most important uh, thing for me is uh, being able to, to to provide for my family and elevate. Um, so I didn't have a lot of work-life balance. I would work uh, 14, 16 hours, whatever it took wow. to get the job done. So as I got to the point where uh, things started to stabilize and the business started to take off and I could invest in others to help me run the business, um, I started to provide and look for more ways to develop work-life balance. Um, and spend time, more time, more quality time with my kids. I always spent time, I, I always felt like I poured into my kids, but I wanted to be able to do so at a higher level. Right. So with the financial freedom came the ability to take my, my daughters um, to Europe for a week and then from Europe we flew to Africa. Wow. And spent a week in Africa. Uh, we climbed Mount, Mount Sinai where Moses uh, received the Ten Commandments, wow. and we shared in that experience. So uh, we saw the Great Pyramids, we saw the Sphinx, uh, so, and we learned about the education and the culture and all of those things uh, of Africa. Amen. Uh, a lot of times people forget that Egypt is in yeah. Africa. That's it. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure that they understood that Europe was, a, was great. But that was vacation. Africa was about education and culture. Amen. So Amen. yeah, um, I, I, I would say as I started, uh, it was very difficult to balance it, but now I have a lot better balance. Uh, but that came with time and yeah. a lot of work a and energy. Work. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. What do I give in that? What has been your biggest loss in life? Wow, I think my biggest loss probably, um, that's a good question. I think my biggest loss is, as I look back, not really realizing my potential as an athlete. Okay. 
Uh, that well, would what be my biggest play? loss. So in football, I played wide receiver and quarterback. In baseball, I played shortstop. You played baseball? All right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So I think my biggest loss, like if I, when I look back at things that I would have done differently, um, I would have played at the intercollegiate level and tried to play at the professional level. Okay. Okay. Uh, I believe I had that level of talent. Now the difference is, and it, uh, and it goes back uh, on some level to parents. So with my daughter who plays uh, volleyball, she got a full ride scholarship to play volleyball. So we poured and pushed her. Uh, as she identified the sport that she wanted to play, right. we made the investment, we pushed and we talked about what was the next level for her. So all of her friends, now her circle of influence, they're talking about playing at the next level. And what does that mean maybe now that you get to that level, right. what does it mean to play professional? What right. does it mean to maybe go to the Olympics? So her influence, her decision set is dramatically different. Right. My parents didn't have that experience and right. that exposure, so they weren't able to afford that to me. They, they would hear their friends, because most of the time they right. work, mm-hmm. they would hear their friends say, hey, Gary's really good, he can play really great. But they never pushed me. I never thought about what was at the next level. Um, but So I think the biggest loss would be uh, not really fully being able to explore that. All right. Yeah. So, but what are you most proud of? What am I most proud of? I would say my children. Okay. Being a father. Okay. Uh, I think as we are here on this earth to make an impact, uh, I think my greatest impact uh, has been in being a father and uh, being able to pour into and leave a legacy for my children. I appreciate that. Yeah. Now, if you could trade places with one person, who mm-hmm. would that be? Um, I would say Nelson Mandela. Okay. And tell me why. For, for me, as I look at right. Nelson's life, uh, and we spoke a little bit about it earlier, magnum opus, uh, where uh, your greatest work, your greatest uh, masterpiece that you develop in life, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people have great talent. And they can do things um, like in higher ed, what, uh, what you have grown to be able to do your skill sets and talents at a C-suite senior level position. You do that and that's a great talent that you have. But in Nelson Mandela's life, he had something greater than talent. He had a purpose. Mm. And so what's the difference between talent and purpose? So talent. You have the ability to do it, you do it greatly, you're the best at what you do. Purpose is something that you can't help but do. It is uh, a divine calling on your life. So maybe part of your talent uh, was being uh, at a C-suite senior level at the institution that you serve at, but your purpose called you into ministry. Amen. So for me, I think uh, knowing what Nelson Mandela sacrifice. He was born into, in his tribe, he was born into uh, an ancestry of leadership and uh, as a prince, if you will, in his tribe. But he forego all of that because he understood that in apartheid South Africa, mm-hmm. that his momentary loss, 27 years in prison and everything that he faced, um, was a setup for a long-term game. And the game may not, at, his, at that time, may not have been for him. Right. He just knew that it was greater than his talent. His purpose was greater than his talent. Amen. So as he served those 27 years in prison and endured the hardships, mm-hmm. he came out um, and was elected, believe it or not, first black uh, president in South Africa. Now imagine you're in South, you're in anywhere on the continent of Africa and you celebrating being a black president. In addition to that, um, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. Yes. So I, I would say um, his focus, his humility, his leadership, 
uh, as we talked about earlier, and his ability to, to, to humble himself to his purpose. Uh, that would be one of the people, if I guess, I, if I had to change places with or who I would aspire to be, it would be Nelson right. Mandela. Well, I appreciate yeah. it. All right. Appreciate that, Doc. Yeah. Now, Doc, you're a very successful man. How has God played a role in your success? Oh, wow. God has and is my success. Amen. So as I looked at uh, my ability to be talented and strategic and all those things that we want to uh, identify as our reasons for success, I always have to go back to and humble myself to know that although we prepare the plan, God prepares the increase. Amen. Uh, so uh, God has been, uh, for me, uh, just the source of everything. Amen. Uh, and that doesn't discount the fact that he gave me, ability, gave me the ability to work hard, to understand concepts, right. to apply them, to try and strategically position myself in places. So it never discounts that, and I think God rewards us for that. But I think more than that is that when we're able to humbly submit to him and know that uh, he's the source of everything, I think he's better able to uh, not only prepare us, but to bless us for that next level. He trusts you now. Amen. You know, Amen. now that you become a better steward at this level, my, my. he said, you know, I, you've been faithful over a few things. Yes. You know, and so I can make you ruler over many. Right. So it's always been an aspiration of mine to continue to grow and evolve. So as God blesses me financially and otherwise, I, my thought is always, OK, we're at this level now. Right. Do we write another book? Do we start another business? Where do we go if I've been able to accumulate $10 million in assets? How do we get to 100 million? How do we get to a billion? If uh, our counterparts, if Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and Jeff Vinnick and others and Oprah Winfrey and others can get there, then certainly I can too. Amen. So for me, uh, humbly submitting to God and knowing that God is the source and not ever being comfortable where I am. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. All right, Doc, as we bring this to a close, uh, any closing words for our listening audience? Any closing words you'd like to say and leave? Any profound statements? Yeah. <laughs> I would say I have, uh, as I was taking my daughter uh, back to college, uh, she has to go back weeks early as an athlete. Uh, she plays middle. Uh, on the volleyball oh, team okay. at Southern Illinois University. Okay. Uh, we were at, uh, we did a road trip. Okay. So we were in Atlanta, we were at a hotel, and on uh, this note uh, that a gentleman left, he talked about Michelangelo. And Michelangelo, and I'm paraphrasing, he talked about that in his work, how he saw the image in the marble. And his job was to clear away all of the clutter around that image to set it free. Mm. That was Michelangelo. So if I had to leave anything or say anything important, imparting what that meant to me when I shared it with my daughter is that for me, for her, and for your audience is that it's important that as sculptors of our own lives is that we are consistently in the process of clearing away the clutter to set that angel free. Whatever that may be, whatever you feel like God has purpose in your life is that it doesn't just happen one time in life. Amen. It's, it's, an, it's an evolutionary, it's a revolutionary process where you're constantly looking at that angel in that marble. And you should always be looking for an opportunity to set that angel free and to remove the clutter. My Jesus, my yeah. Jesus. Now, last question, Doc. Yes, sir. What is the best talk show <laughs> in the land? Well, I hear and I truly believe uh, that my brother Reggie Webb, a word with uh, Pastor Webb, is the most important, most relevant, most topical talk show in the land. And I wholeheartedly submit this young man and support this young man 
Uh, he has been tremendous in my life. We have known each other for at least 30 plus years. Yes. Yeah. He's a good brother. Thanks so much, man. Yes, sir. And to my listening audience, may God bless you real good.